outside, but as long as we're inside. Uh, the first talk, we're, we're going to talk about um, mitochondria. So the first talk is by Cecilia Saccone, and as you can see, the mitochondrion, a cellular strategy for life and evolution. Okay, I am glad that the Abus decided, you know, to finance a meeting on the molecular evolution, and so I'm directly also on the evolution of a mitochondrial DNA. Uh, of course, I, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me to speak uh, on this topic, which I spend a life uh, really around it. So, uh, my presentation will be in a three part, a short introduction, particularly for people who are not familiar with, uh, with mitochondrial system and mitochondri with the mitochondrial genomics. Then our experimental data, and the third part, I think, can uh, generate a discussion and uh, some conclusion, can give some conclusion. So, the, um, uh, the necessity of the energy to, uh, for genome complexity, which may appear rather, uh, you know, obvious and intuitive, was uh, the central theme of a very interesting review um, of Lane and Martin, which made some uh, calculation on which I don't want to spend time because Bill is here, so you, he can explain better than me, but the essential is that eukaryote cell has more metabolic power and then can build new gene and protein thanks to their metabolic power. But why? What is the secret? The secret was an innovation for the eukaryotic cell, the, the, some structure that we call organelle, like mitochondria and uh, chloroplast, but my talk will be made, well, completely on mitochondrial uh, genome. And uh, this, they uh, were able to provide energy and as a membrane potential. And so in this way, uh, they overcome the energetic barrier um, that uh, the prokaryote possess because they can never evolve as an eukaryotic cell and so multicellularity, just to start, was only possible thanks to the energy provided by the mitochondria and chloroplasts, of course. Thus, mitochondrial genes are key to nuclear genome expansion. But the cell complexity requires symbiotic energetics. It is well known, and this will be, you know, also, I think, uh, a topic uh, on which uh, Bill Martin uh, will speak later on, that the, uh, the, uh, during the evolution, the uh, prokaryotes, which, are, which were uh, are progenitor of the mitochondria, they transfer the majority of the uh, gene content, genetic content, to the nucleus. And, uh, but, and, uh, and so, but this uh, a tiny amount of information remain in the mitochondria, and thus uh, nobody, you know, can explain why uh, this uh, genome still persists today. And in this slide, there are three major hypotheses and suggestions um, to justify the persistence of a mitochondrial DNA. And the first one is DCDH, the code disparity hypothesis, that which postulates that indeed the difference in genetic code between nuclear mitochondrial gene block the complete transfer of mitochondrial coding sequence in nucleus. 
That, but, you know, this is uh, not very convincing because in the various organisms, a lot of modification of RNA, uh, like editing, so occurred. So I don't think that this is, could be a complete justification. Also, the uh, HH hydrophobicity hypothesis, uh, which postulates that mitochondria ox for subunits are too hydrophobic to be synthesized the cytoplasm and the dust that they need to be produced in loco. There, there were many experiments demonstrating that the gene can be allocated in a different compartment and their expression is, uh, and is uh, assured. So like this very, you know, um, supercova in uh, two years ago, um, <coughs> demonstrating an allotopic expression of the mitochondrial gene as subunit of the cytochrome oxidase in yeast. So thus then we have another um, very interesting indeed hypothesis uh, with the collocation for redox regulation which postulated that the expression of the genetic material of, of the mitochondrial genome should be regulated by the, um, re, the, 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 by the redox state so, and, and so re require a regulation in a local. But uh, so, in, uh, in essence, the two fundamental questions remain open. Why and how the mitochondrial genome does persist in evolution, and also which and how many roles does it play in the eukaryote? And so, uh, if we look at the structure of the mitochondria, we know this is, uh, you know, uh, compared to rickettsia, the uh, mitochondrial genome in, in many organisms, and uh, the red, in red is the coding capacity. As you can see, the size, um, the, the size is different. Uh, Sometimes the shape, although, you know, the circularity is uh, the rule, apparently, and and thus the coding capacity is also uh, very different. And from this review of the gray, you can see that compared to the, the biggest mitochondrial genome, you have, you know, in the various organisms, with, um, the eukaryote, the protozoa, plant, and, and metazoa, etc., you know, a, a very a small amount of coding material. But, uh, well, what are the constants? So the constants are always presence of gene coding for some subunits of Oxfos complexes, which the complexes through which uh, the, the is generated energy, 95% of the cell energy, the cell necess uh, the, uh, the energy necessary for, cell, for the cell is provided by mitochondria, but also also, the presence of gene, there are always some gene for, for component of the protein synthesis machinery. Some, the two ribosomal RNA spaces in plant are three, three ribosomal RNA, a certain number of transfer RNA, in some cases they are imported from outside, and in some cases as in plant also ribosomal protein. So the point is that, so what we can derive from this common constant. One, we have gene which interacts with nuclear coding gene for Oxfos. And the second point, uh, which is mo the very important, a special um, protein synthesizing machinery. Um, if we look at uh, the uh, genetic property of the mitochondrial RNA, uh, so we have, uh, we know that uh, it's uniparental inherited, so we have a smaller effective population size than the nucleus, and uh, um, uh, uniparental transmission, this is the rule, and then uh, the, the higher mutation input, um, generally, 
probably because uh, although there are debating data, uh, data on this uh, point uh, that some repair system are absent in the mitochondria or are, are limited. Uh, some other they uh, claim that there is a real uh, functioning repair system. Anyway, um, recombination is not present. This is not, um, uh, there is no recombination except um, some really uh, exceptional uh, percentage of recombination, which is uh, not very influenced. So the, um, the consequence is that we have um, a mutational meltdown of mitochondrial DNA, a slow fixation deleterium mutation, and this loss of variability and fer fer fertility. So what should, the, the, if uh, mitochondrial DNA has to persist, it should, um, you know, solve this problem and, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, and uh, having uh, uh, with a process which for, for melting, uh, uh, mitigating the melting down of the uh, mitochondrial DNA. So, um, in, in other words, I would I emphasize that for its feature, among which uniparental inheritance, lack of recombination, a mitochondrial DNA should be doomed to extinction for the miller ratchet organism. So its survival will be always linked to strategy for mitigating the melting down. What are these strategies? These strategies are in metazoa, um, some quality control mechanism on which uh, um, now I cannot uh, speak because I have no, no time, perhaps in the discussion, and uh, there, there are some germline bottlers. There is a selection in the germline. The number of uh, in the ovogeny are reduced uh, in the, the maturation of, of ovocyte to very few molecules of mitochondrial DNA. Then, uh, during the ovocyte maturation, the mitochondrial DNA, you know, as, um, is duplicated uh, re uh, and then reaches uh, a very high number of uh, uh, mitochondria. Uh, mitochondrial DNA mo molecule, but there is a, the, the process, the follicular atresia, which re after, you know, uh, in the fetal life and after the birth also, recognize the molecule that are not uh, mitochondrial DNA. This is uh, the explanation, which are not good for the next generation. And so we have the, uh, uh, the, the atresia of the, uh, of the follicles and with the ovocyte. So there is, there is a, a real, then it well, has also been described this mitochondrial cloud in which during the uh, maturation of ovocyte and then after the embryo, a special number of molecules uh, of, of, uh, of uh, DNA which are um, not, uh, you know, um, more intact perhaps uh, with the potentiality of um, uh, to, to, uh, to give the potentiality to pass in the further generation. And uh, this phenomenon, what is, uh, what is very interesting, is more the and in the uh, animal, we have a slow progeny, like human. Instead, in uh, um, a, you know, aquatic animal, it's not so, um, so strong. The, mm, so, uh, well, uh, in relation to this uh, problem, uh, what is the role, how is uh, it evolves, uh, and we are... Uh, um, we have done, um, you know, some experiment, and indeed, um, more than 10 years ago, we, 
which doesn't measure the, the substitution rate of mitochondrial DNA. I think that uh, all assume that mitochondrial DNA evolve more rapidly and then nuclear DNA. But then in that time, uh, with a few, uh, few data, because we have not the data, uh, many, many data, we were able to, uh, the, um, uh, to demonstrate that um, mitochondrial DNA evolve more rapidly than nuclear DNA only for some component. As you can see, the non-synonymous site, uh, they have more or less the, um, uh, the, the value uh, that which are comparable between mitochondrial nuclear DNA and the synonymous site instead uh, the small ribosomal RNA evolve 20 times uh, uh, um, faster and the transfer RNA 100 times and um, well. So, um, in, uh, in uh, and then other than well, I cannot uh, um, speak about uh, the this region of, met of mitochondrial DNA, which is called uh, the D loop, which has a species specific evolution. Okay, and uh, more recently, and we uh, wanted to start this, this in more detail and having more uh, data. And so you know, you know that this <coughs> is the center of functional genomic and system biolo biology and uh, started the new analysis to fill the gap between genome and the phenotype variable. And uh, um, <coughs> Yeah, and so we um, we were aware, aware of the um, the what was found for nuclear gene, but what about the mitochondria? So. Uh, what happened in the nucleus? We know that um, there are uh, two hypotheses which are uh, very important. Uh, the Bulmer hypothesis, which is the better efficiency hypothesis, according to which some isoceptor transfer RNA are more expressed than others, and, and codon recognized by them a low, faster, and cheaper translation. And also, the, more or less in the same time, the better accuracy of Akashi uh, postulate that some codon are best recognized by their transfer RNA and uh, other synonymous codon, and their use minimize the amino acid misincorporation. Uh, from this, uh, Dramon and uh, Wilkie more recently validated the Akash hypothesis, and they uh, put forward the misincorporation induced misfolding, in which uh, the rate of translation is the dominant factor for sequence evolution rate. Depends more on constraint, in, in other words, the sequence evolution rate depends more on constraint related to protein production, so to the protein synthesized machinery, than on protein function. So this uh, um no, this is uh, the, uh, again so the uh, MIM hypothesis, and we wonder it is valid for the mitochondria. So we started um, to be uh, to be considered that the Balmer hypothesis is difficult to frame for mitochondria because all amino acids are translated by a single um, transfer RNA, uh, when it's differently from nucleus. So it is difficult to. Look Look for difference of efficiency due to availability of transfer RNA. Um, and of course, as I said, we have to consider the transfer RNA import. Uh, the, and then the lack, the, uh, there is a lack for mitochondrial RNA, lack of comprehensive expression data for mitochondria. Uh, difficult thus to check for correlation between the expression and intensity of a codon usage bias. So for uh uh, uh, for the, um, the mitochondria, we um, we wanted to to, to study uh, to uh, to, um, uh, to study the characteristics of codon um, uh, um, codon usage, and in particular, in particular, we wonder if synonymous variability is completely neutral. <coughs> 
il, eh, eh, because the, el, eh, in, 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 eh, in all in all animals from E. coli to human, and it, it is well known that synonymous codon is not really neutral because it's correlated to non-synonymous codon. And so, to study the, uh, the colon usage, we used, uh, you know, two set of uh, um, metazoa and vertebrate and insect, and we, uh, we have measured the effective number of codon uh, for each uh, genome. You can see now we have a lot of quite a lot of, of genome, and, uh, um, and then we measure the effective number of colon, uh, which has, uh, goes from 20, if one uses, a colon is used per amino acid, to 60. The expected um, <coughs> ANC, so the estimation based on the, the test colon uh, position of quasi degenerate colon family, and uh, we uh, look at uh, the, the model using uh, the uh, ANOVA system. And uh, the results are in this uh, slide. As you can see, the variance of effective number of code is uh, as, uh, for the 50% in, um, uh, in vertebrate and um, uh, 60, more than 60% is uh, uh, the, the uh, effective number of codon is uh, explained by the expected one. So this means that by mutation rate, that uh, uh, explain the use of codon. But the species and gene are, um, have a significant value uh, in, for, um, uh, for the codon used. And, but, uh, well, the same cannot, we found no um, significant for genetic position and for the strand where the, uh, the, um, the gene were coded. Um, then we, um, with another set of vertebrates in this case, uh, we, uh, we wanted to study if uh, the beam translation, so the beam hypothesis was um, also uh, valid for the mitochondrial protein synthesis machinery. And so to make the, uh, the, uh, the, the story short with this uh, set of data, uh, we, um, uh, is, we just uh, tested the, uh, uh, the Drummond and Wilkie hypothesis. In other words, we want to, like to see if this uh, uh, selection act on the synonymous uh, change. And thus, uh, if uh, there is a correlation between uh, uh, non-synonymous non and synonymous variation. So the hypothesis was rejected in mitochondria because, as you can see, uh, the angular coefficient was very near to zero. So, um, what are the, uh, uh, you know, the evolutionary forces acting on mitochondria? So, it's particularly uh, the, um, uh, the negative purifying selection. As you can see here, um, in, uh, uh, in this slide, the value of uh, the end log of the NADS are the, uh, negative under zero, and this, this for, it, for all uh, the gene, um, um, for all the gene coded by mitochondrial DNA. You know, the purifying selection is uh, stronger, it's not stronger, no, stronger for the COX and for cytochrome, uh, cytochrome B, but uh, um, less on the RTPase gene, gene, but were also of negative value. So, um, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, variability for uh, the uh, synonymous uh, um, variability of synonymous uh, variation is uh, very stable and is more or less equal for all the gene, whereas, uh, as we have demonstrated also previously, it's, it's a bit different, but also of a negative value for all the gene and for all the complexes. 
but uh, so uh, more recently we have uh, um, uh, used uh, another data set, Homo and uh, the chimpanzee, and two species on um, uh, uh, chimpanzee. Uh, for the rationale of this is compare the rate of changes in this two genome. And uh, we, um, we used the KA, uh, KA and KS for each complex. And uh, in this uh, slide, each complex was estimated as a supergene. Supergene, we attacked the, the sequence of the gene of the complex, of each complex. You know that, uh, the, for example, the complex cytochrome oxidase, complex 4, is, uh, is, uh, the three genes are coded in mitochondria, and we attached this just to have more significant data. And uh, was in this is how you can see that mitochondria uh, data are, you know, uh, in, you know, the inferior to the nuclear uh, value, Ka to Ks, as we found uh, well in agreement with our previous data. However, if we um, uh, measure only Ka, so the amino acid substitution, the non-synonymous substitution, uh, always using the supergene, we found that Ka is major of uh, for mitochondrial gene that for nuclear genes. So, but if we, uh, you know, normalize for KS, so for the rate of uh, synonymous substitution, we can see that Homo sapiens uh, versus uh, um, panthroclodites has, you know, as you can see, for nuclear mitochondrial uh, genes of, of always referred to Oxfos complexes, more or less the same KEA value, whereas, as expected, the synonymous value is much higher. So then, uh, well, at, um, at the end, we have um, uh, <coughs> investigated on the intraspecies polymorphism for Homo sapiens uh, for pan troglodytes and pan paniscus. It's in order to verify if data are compatible with biogenic adaptation in homo, but not in pan. And in, uh, um, you can see here that PS reflect well the different depths of the, um, the common ancestor. So in other, in other words, if we look um, in this, uh, um, this slide, the value of HOMO as the least synonymous nucleotide diversity, uh, uh, having the youngest, most recent common ancestor. But uh, if we uh, measure the ratio, uh, the polymorphism, non synonymous and synonymous, uh, we see that um, Homo came out as the most fast evolving species of the three. Because, uh, in other words, you know, he has. Uh, um, in experience, you know, different, uh, different, much more different environment with respect to the two species of, um, uh, of chimpanzee. And so, the, our conclusion, mutation barrier across genome position and define code on usage. Purified selection is strong and changes from gene to gene but there is no good evidence for selection acting on synonymous change. So the, uh, uh, the uh, misrelation induced misfolding hypothesis does not apply to mitochondrial protein synthesis. Consequently, this accurate protein translation does not seem an acute problem in mitochondria. Why uh, this is an, an imp important? Because in this scenario, amino acid changes can explore a larger area. Mitochondrial DNA becomes, uh, perhaps, uh, can become a suitable tool for adaptation. So the, uh, 
the overall uh, scenario is uh, a uh, high mutational pressure, simplified the repairing of mutagenic effect of ROS, which I couldn't uh, uh, discuss. Uh, of course, there is a strong selection pressure on gene functionality, and probably uh, due to also to intra-individual quality control system. And then uh, there is uh, this bigenomic control on the OXFOS phenotype. Um, and so we have to take into, into account, uh, on one side, the okay, uh, co-evolution across the genome. On the other side, of course, the possibility of mitochondrial nuclear incompatibility. <coughs> And so, and for the uh, possible role of mitochondrial DNA in the adaptation, a modulation of energy produ production to reach a new adaptive peak. So, um, um, energy is important for the cell uh, in every sense, but, and is uh, dictate the style, or the, the style of the life. In other words, it is, uh, you know, probably the main reason for longevity Longevity for aging, for <laughs> life, uh, cell cycle, and for uh, thus apoptosis. So, well, uh, to make the story short, I would like uh, to uh, to stress uh, some practical implication for mitochondrial uh, DNA evolutionary dynamic. Um, you know, the role of a mitochondrial DNA in physio physiological and pathological processes uh, and considering the key role of energetic budget, interaction among the OXPOS gene, uh, compensation of mutation, identification of quality control pathway, uh, and these are all, um, uh, all features relevant to, uh, to mitochondrial disease. Uh, it is repeated that Doug Wallace is not here. And um, then uh, there is another aspect, uh, repeat, uh, repeated positive selection event, increased effectiveness of mitochondrial DNA uh, as a species marker. I think it is well known that for metazoa, mitochondrial DNA in DNA barcode initiative has been suggested to use mitochondrial DNA. This can be a justification anyway. So this is a still an open area. And, uh, um, and then, uh, change, because uh, there is a change in efficiency of purified selection on a slightly deleterious mutation, and uh, if there is events of a positive selection, we wonder, is mitochondrial DNA a good population marker? Uh, I, I finish. Um, and so, um, oh, well, here I have, um, have reported some data of the literature because it is very debated if it's a drift of selection for mitochondrial DNA and, uh, um, and, and so I don't want, uh, according to our opinion, uh, that mitochondrial DNA should become the key regulator of adaptation of population in new environment. Some people also believe that it has a great role in the speciation. That's uh, to finish. There are three positive uh, situations of mitochondrial genome to look at the mitochondrial genome, a vestigial genome in a, slow de a genome in slow degeneration, um, a, or a frozen genome hold the key as a fiction function for the organism and dominated by purifying selection. Uh, the possibility we prefer is a specialized uh, genome, all the key fixed function for the organ, but these functions are continually finely tuned by, uh, to the energetic niche of the organism and uh, its dynamics are conditioned by repeated positive selection events. Thank you. Uh, no, I have to acknowledge the collaboration of uh, Saverio Vicario and Stefano Castellana for code on usage data and Marcella Timonelli and Roberta Pirenda for human and pan data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll follow your suggestion that we discuss everything at the same time at the end because we're running out of time. And as Cecilia just mentioned, uh, Doug, unfortunately Doug Wallace is not here, so we're going to move on to the next talk by Bill Martin, uh, Mitochondria and the Energetics of 
genome complexity. And while you're getting set up, I'll just say that what we're going to do at the end is we're going to use a little extra time for the discussion of these two talks and then a couple of other issues uh, if we have time uh, to discuss uh, and if everyone isn't completely exhausted. So, Bill, are you? And do you have the... Uh, Warning, you will be disconnected from the network. Sorry about that. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's a great honor to be here. It's um, always wonderful to be invited to the meetings that Georgia organizes. They're always among the best there are. And this is no exception. So, let's talk about something a little bit different relative to what the other talks have been about. So what do we do in my group? We work on this thing here. This is a plant cell. This is very simple, okay? You don't have to worry about any of this complicated stuff in evolution. This is all very simple. This is about carbon and energy metabolism and basic pathways and the things that make life work. So uh, this is the center of uh, investigation in my group. This is a eukaryotic cell, a plant cell. And we look at the pathways of core carbon and energy metabolism as they are compartmentalized between chloroplasts, the cytosol, and mitochondria. So the work in our group is a study in cell compartmentation. And I believe it to be true that the basis of our understanding of cell compartmentation in eukaryotes is based in the endosymbiotic origins of organelles. Chloroplast used to be free-living cyanobacteria. Mitochondria used to be free-living proteobacteria. The genomes of both organelles attest beyond all reasonable doubt to the view that both were once free-living prokaryotes, but the genomes of both organelles are very highly reduced. Chloroplast DNA encodes between 60 and 200 proteins. Mitochondrial DNA encodes between 3 and 63 proteins. Nonetheless, both organelles contain approximately as many proteins as their free-living cousins, the cyanobacteria and protobacteria, on the order of 1,000 to 2,000 proteins. And so in order to explain uh, the difference between the number of proteins encoded in organelle DNA and the number of proteins contained in the organelle, there's a corollary to endosymbiotic theory called endosymbiotic gene transfer. And it goes like this. During the course of evolution, genes were transferred from the organelles to the hosts of their chromosomes, where they became integrated, acquired the proper expression and targeting sequences so that the mRNAs could be synthesized in the nucleus, translated on cytosolic ribosomes, and imported into the protein of their genetic origin on a daily basis since. That's endosymbiotic gene transfer, a term that I coined about 20 years ago. So we saw this today in Yerza Yurka's talk. Nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. And um, Mike Lynch has modified this. Nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of population genetics. But I work on carbon and energy metabolism. 
and nothing either in biology or evolution makes a difference whatsoever ex without energy metabolism. Now we can do this experiment, okay? Let's take a plastic bag, everybody put it over their head and hold it really tight for 53 seconds. Evolution in this room will come to a screeching halt, at least for the humans, right? So the, the microbes in our gut will then uh, take over, but this is, it's, it's the, the, the basic machinery of generating energy. That's what allows all this other stuff in evolution to take place. And that's the one, that's the, the part of biology that I'm interested in. Where does this energy come from? As a few, uh, a few cornerstones just to get a, a, a feel for it. A typical microbe synthesizes about 100 times its body weight in ATP for every cell division. Okay, so there's, there's a main chemical reaction going on. From this chemical reaction, it makes ATP. And in, before it's made enough ATP to make two cells, it's synthesized 100 times its body weight in ATP. A typical human synthesizes about a body weight of ATP every day. And that means until we have reproduced, we synthesize about 500 tons of ATP before we get to reproductive stage. That's about 5,000 body weights. So the basic machinery of synthesizing all this ATP, that has to work without a hitch before anything else in the population or genome level that can be heritable even comes into play. So these, these basic pathways of core carbon and energy metabolism are under particularly high purifying selection. Uh, there's not all that much variation going on there, and it's not surprising that that's the case. So if we are going to look at how these, um, you know, the, the role of organelles in evolution or the, the, the um, evolutionary basis of cell compartmentation in eukaryotes, we have to look at the literature and look at the models, look at the theories, and then test them with molecular data. The problem is that there are a lot of models. Now, most people are not familiar with these, and that's why it's late in the day, Everybody's kind of tired, so let's just walk you through them slowly, and everybody can fall asleep in the process. So what is endosymbiotic theory? Endosymbiotic theory, uh, Stephen Jay Gould called it the quirky side of biology, okay? Uh, Ludmilla has been doing some interviews, and she asked about the good and the bad and the ugly of evolution. Well, the good is population genetics. That's the stuff that's easy to model and easy to look at. Uh, the bad is... Um, I don't know, I won't put any label on bad, but the ugly is endosymbiosis, right? This is, the, there's been a strong resistance to the concept of endosymbiosis ever since its inception. The first, uh, the founder of uh, endosymbiotic theory as we know it is Konstantin Marischkovsky, a Russian uh, biologist working at the University of Kazan, and in a series of papers in 1905 and 1910, he founded the thoroughly modern theory for the origin of chloroplast from cyanobacteria. And uh, he had another theory for the origin uh, of two symbioses in his theory. The first was the origin of the nucleus from uh, engulfment of a micrococcus. And it's very interesting to note that all of the physiological attributes that uh, Marischkovsky was trying to explain with this micrococcal symbiosis for the origin of the nucleus, today we would associate with mitochondria. So he got the two symbioses right. He just got the wrong organelle. Now, you'll note that there's a little bit of a gap here of about 57 years. How come? How come? We ran into this the other day with, um, uh, with uh, hybridization and conventional wisdom. So this is, this is uh, Marischkowski's figure from his 1910 paper where he shows a very explicit symbiotic theory here. He's got the first symbiosis here giving rise to the nucleus. Here's his host. He actually thought that the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes so di were so different that they uh, arose twice independently, two independent origins of life. That's just an early statement of the differentness of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And this second symbiosis here, cyanophyce, these are cyanobacteria giving rise to the plastids of the different plants. Very explicit and absolutely right. In 1910, he, um, in an addendum to this paper, inferred that protein synthesis takes place in chloroplasts. Given the tools of the day, that was a really sharp inference. But you can go a long way. The endosymbiotic theory is very powerful. But this ran into problems. Edmund B. Wilson, the, uh, 
the dominant force in his day with his famous textbook, The Cell and Development and Heredity, didn't like endosymbiosis. A thousand page textbook, and there are three pages on organelles in which he writes, such an hypothesis, endosymbiosis, is of course unverifiable, and for this reason, too many will appear worthless. To many, no doubt, such speculations may seem too fantastic for mention in polite biological society. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is within the range of possibility that they may someday call for more serious consideration. Now, what he did, what he did is he damned endosymbiotic theory in three pages of his textbook, the standard text, college textbook of the day. It stayed damned for 50 years. The moral of that story is that powerful scientists cannot promote progress in their field. They can only resist the opportunity to oppress it. And that usually turns out to be difficult enough. Okay, so that, that uh, paragraph there cost us 50 years. And um, in 1967, of course, Lynn Margulis, under the name of Lynn Sagan, uh, repopularized endosymbiotic theory. There was a paper that appeared the same year in Nature, very strange paper with only two references, probably somehow leaning on this one, which was a major contribution in journal theoretical biology. Margulis um, modified endosymbiotic theory by suggesting that the host was maybe a mycoplasma-like cell, again, an amoeboid here, a purple bacterium giving rise to the mitochondrion, a spirochete giving rise to the flagella, and that gives us our eukaryotic cell here. She always held on up until her death, untimely death this year, uh, may her soul rest in peace, that the spirochete was the, uh, uh, an endosymbiotic origin of flagella, an idea that nobody has ever, um, beyond, beyond herself, given much credence and that molecular data never supported. So now that the cat was out of the bag and somebody was saying it, okay, it was interesting, if you go back into the literature, uh, the, the phycological literature, algae literature, plant literature of the 1950s and 1960s, you can find occasional papers where they mention endosymbiotic theory. The, 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 the plant biologists knew that it was right, but they weren't allowed to say it. You know, so they'd come home from the lab at night, go into the closet and say, plasters are some cyanobacteria, and then they'd open the closet and come back out and feel much better, but they weren't allowed to say it in public. So Duduve, who also... Um, had been following this. Okay, now that Margulis broke the ice, all of a sudden a lot of ideas started to come out from very prominent microbiologists. Christian Duduve in 1969 had his own version of endosymbiotic theory. It had peroxisomes uh, as endosymbionts as well. And um, Roger Stanier had the, uh, the interesting view that maybe the plastid was first in, in uh, endosymbiotic theory because he said mitochondria were about oxygen and there's no point in having a mitochondrion unless you have a source of oxygen. So he had the plastid first. Today we know that that's not true. Sorry? Sorry? That's a third of your time. I just wanted to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Well, we'll just stop. So uh, then there was resistance to uh, endosymbiosis with Raff and Mahler and Bogorad and Cavalier-Smith in 1975. These are autogenous theories for the origins of organelles that work by invagination or restructuring of membranes. These are, you know, this is science, this is science, this is nature. These are very prominent papers. And this just goes to show that biologists really didn't like this idea of endosymbiosis, and they were looking hard for alternatives to avoid it. Um, okay, then came the discovery of archaebacteria, and then archaebacteria started to figure into endosymbiotic theories. Uh, a very nice paper by Van Dillen and um, Lee Van Dillen, who also recently passed away, and Mariana in Nature in 1980 articulating this autogenous theory for the origin of eukaryotes, but without endosymbiosis. Um, oh, other theories here by Gold and Dring and Cavalier-Smith. Oh, the, then we get into uh, the days where we started to have sequence-based analyses, and the archaebacteria started to figure into eukaryotic origins in a different way, different models here by Zillick suggesting that maybe the nucleus was an endosymbiont. This is Merezkowski's original idea. Uh, David Moyera had another theory here with uh, generating an A mitochondriate eukaryote. Then a year later, they noticed that they forgot the mitochondrion, so they added the mitochondrion in this consortium. Uh, Lynn Margulis came back and added her, her version to get the nucleus from the uh, spirochete in 2000. On we go, and on we go, and on we go. Um, so now a half of my time is gone, and I'm a third of the way through my talk. Um, I've pitched in here with a different theory that focused on an archaebacterial host and a hydrogen-producing alpha, uh, 
protein uh, alpha mitochondrion. Patrick Fortair has tried to modify that recently by bringing the planktomycetes into play, which are complicated prokaryotes. There are a lot of models. Okay, we're not done yet because there are still basically two classes of models here, those that derive a uh, mitochondrion lacking eukaryote over here from prokaryotes and those that derive a eukaryote directly from a symbiosis between prokaryotes. That is, over here, the host for the origin of mitochondria is an alpha proteobacterium, is, a, is an archaeobacterium, and over here there's some preparatory step in route to getting to this um, hypothetical organism here called an archaeozoon that has been around in the literature for a long time. So only one of these theories over here using an archaeobacterial host works, um, takes, account, uh, takes into account or accounts for hydrogenosomes. Um, not many of you have heard of my hydrogenosomes, so I'll probably have to explain them briefly. What are hydrogenosomes? Hydrogenosomes are anaerobic mitochondria. They are very important in the anaerobic world. They are anaerobic forms of mitochondria that do not contain a genome. Here's a picture of hydrogenosomes in the anaerobic ciliate Plagia pila frontata. Next to these hydrogenosomes are M-labeled endosymbionts. These are methanogenic archaeobacteria that live next to the hydrogenosomes in these ciliates. And when the first time I saw this was in a talk by Nicholas Muller, who discovered hydrogenosomes, and I asked, what the heck are methanogenic and uh, and the symbionts doing in the cytosol of a ciliate next to these organelles called hydrogenosomes. Well, it's actually pretty well known, but we need to know what hydrogenosomes are doing. So in order to understand that, the, the uh, basic uh, chemistry of a hydrogenosome is shown here. Like mitochondria, they're surrounded by two membranes. They import pyruvate and subject it to oxidative decarboxylation, just like mitochondria, but their enzyme is not pyruvate dehydrogenase. They use pyruvate ferredox and oxidoreductase an oxygen-sensitive enzyme that um, generates CO2 from oxidative decarboxylation. The electrons are passed, to, passed on to ferredoxin that donates them to a hydrogenase that dumps those electrons on protons to generate molecular hydrogen as an end product of metabolism, hence the name of the organelle. And in mitochondria, we have a citric acid cycle to regenerate coenzyme A for this reaction up here. Hydrogenosomes don't have a citric acid cycle. They have a two-enzyme cycle here called uh, involving two enzymes, acetate succinate CoA transferase, that transfers, transfers the CoA moiety from acetyl CoA to succinate to generate succinyl CoA and acetate as an end product. How much time do I have left? And the, uh, the, thioest, the energy in the thioester bond uh, in this molecule here is used to generate ATP via substrate level phosphor phosphorylation, and that's basically it. Acetate, CO2, and hydrogen from pyruvate oxidation, and that's why methanogens like to snuggle up to these hydrogenosomes because they live off of the end products of hydrogenosomal metabolism. Methanogens are strictly anaerobic chemolithoautotrophic prokaryotes that um, generate their energy from the reduction of CO2 with electrons from hydrogen, process of making methane. That is their source of ATP. And they use that ATP to synthesize glucose, also from hydrogen and CO2, in an autotrophic pathway. Their carbon and energy metabolism is dependent upon the end products of hydrogenosomal metabolism. That's why this is called anaerobic syntrophy. Miklas and I explored the, explored the idea that maybe this was the context of mitochondrial origins, the methanogen just being a hydrogen-dependent host. That gives it a very strong association to the hydrogen-producing, facultatively anaerobic ancestor of mitochondria. And this uh, association in anaerobic syntrophy is very similar, would be very similar to the association between the methanogens and hydrogenosomes in the ciliate. And that would be stable, but would be limiting because this, the, the association is based on the host dependence on this H2 here. So that would give us cellular associations increasing that surface area. but if the endosymbiont were to get inside all the way, we'd have a problem because these guys are dependent upon H2 and CO2, and, then, and they're also autotrophs, so they don't have any organic importers. So in order for this symbiosis to survive, the host would either have to invent importers and a, and a catabolic carbon metabolism, or we just go through one round of endosymbiotic gene transfer, the genes for the glycolytic pathway, and for these organic importers, this would give us a facultatively anaerobic bipartite cell with an archaeobacterial genetic apparatus and 
um, chimeric chromosomes in the cytosol, a facultatively anaerobic mitochondrial ancestor of common ancestor mitochondrial hydrogenosomes generating that energy. And so in a cartoon, it would look like this, two cells associated, they get tighter, one gets inside the other. Lysis and uh, just release of DNA for recombination. If this recombination doesn't work, then the next endosymbiont can lyse and that can donate more DNA. These little structures here are group two introns and Eugene Kunin will be watching this and saying, aha, these are these introns that help us generate the nucleus. That's right, but we'll not go into that today. Proliferation of the mitochondria and generating, uh, generation of the eukaryotic uh, novelties that are specific to the eukaryotic kingdom using mitochondrial energy. Okay, now the test of these hypotheses is based upon comparison of the anaerobes, and we're not going to go through that today because I've got the maps of all these anaerobic eukaryotes of animals, anaerobic lugworms, anaerobic uh, peanut worms, anaerobic fungi, entamoeba, giardia, trichomonas, tree trichomonas, trypanosomes, uh, euglena, and nyctotherus. So that's how I feel when I see the developmental pathways, right? It's just too much. So. I've saved you all of that to make a long story short. When we, com the, when we compare the uh, biology and the biochemistry of the anaerobes to the, the predictions of the hydrogen hypothesis or other theories for the origin of eukaryotes, we see that we do very well. Hydrogenosomes really are mitochondria. The other theories never made a comment on that. Primitively a mitochondria eukaryotes <laughs> never existed. That's turned out to be a very robust prediction of the theory, and the uh, opposing theories made the opposite prediction. Eukaryotic aerobes and anaerobes should interleave. We were also right on that. So let's move on to the genome predictions. So genetically speaking, eukaryotes should be chimeras, and they should be specifically um, uh, have affinity to uriarchaeotes with respect to the genetic apparatus and proteobacteria with respect to um, energy metabolism, plus a few uh, other uh, diverse gene origins allowing for LGT, whereas the opposing theories suggest that eukaryotes should be derived from actinobacteria or planktomycetes or clostridia or what have you. So if we look for genes that are present in the eukaryote common ancestor and have homologs in prokaryotes and make alignments of those. we we do sequence searching, we look for families that were present in the eukaryote common ancestor and have homologs and prokaryotes, do alignments and trees, what do we find? We find that there are about 700, 500, and, uh, a total of about 700 genes in the eukaryote common ancestor that is present in animals and fungi and algae and plants and that have clear-cut prokaryotic homologs. Of those, about 80% show a single origin present in eukaryotes and acquired from prokaryotes in the common ancestor. And we want to look at those because those should tell us where eukaryotes came from, where they acquired those their genes from. So what do we get? To make a long story short, we get very strong contributions from the uriarchaeotes, lesser from the other groups of uh, archaeobacteria. These are the genes that, uh, the red means that the, the uh, uh, gene in question was in the sister group to the eukaryotes. Gray means that homologs from these other groups were also in the tree. Here are 571 down here. These genes up to here show a single origin that is a unique group. These down here show mixed sister groups and these mixed eubacterial groups and here mixed in general. So who's the winner? If you break this down into the functional categories, all right, for the genes that are uh, well represented among the archaeobacteria, what you find is that indeed the largest contribution that we can see um, from the archaeobacterial side is from the uriarchaeotes, specifically for the informational class over here, and um, in energy metabolism, it's from the alpha proteobacteria for energy production, and that is a pretty clear-cut signal. We see two major contributions. We see some other uh, spurious contributions simply because trees that deep will tend to get spurious answers. But the prediction of our theory was we should see methanogens and alpha proteobacteria and nothing else, and that's basically what we see. So we're not claiming victory here, but we are saying that this, the, the theory holds up to the, to the predictions of um, 
comparative genomic analysis. Okay, so we know that along with the cell cycle, mitosis, meiosis, intron, spliceome, centrioles, nucleus, ER, Golgi, membrane traffic, flagella, a eukaryotic cytoskeleton, 2,000 novel gene families in the eukaryote common ancestor, and 500 gene families with clearly defined prokaryotic homologs. The last eukaryotic common ancestor also had mitochondria. Why? What's the connection? Okay, so the, the, the question is, what do mitochondria have to do all this, and why is it that prokaryotes never evolved any of these attributes over here? The only cells that in, evolved these attributes are the ones that have mitochondria. Is there a connection? Yes, and this is the last slide. <clears throat> We're having trouble communicating this, but basically what we found is the following. We found that eukaryotes per gram generate the same amount of energy as prokaryotes. That is, if we were to take a cubic meter, and that was, say, one eukaryotic cell with its mitochondria, it generates per gram just as much energy as the same volume or weight of prokaryotes. It's just that prokaryotes in this cubic meter, there wouldn't be one, there would be about 10,000. So what is going on? We've got 10,000 prokaryotes in this cubic meter, and we've got one eukaryote over here. This, the, the prokaryotes have 10,000 times their 5 million base pairs, or 5,000 genes, each, each uh, repeated in each individual cell. The eukaryote has mitochondria with very highly specialized genomes within the organelle that allow them to perform the Oxfox function that Cecilia was just talking about. It's that simple. Per gram, the same amount of energy, but what's happened is that the, the DNA required to support 10,000 prokaryotic cells is basically all gone from the cytosol and it's concentrated in a single diploid genome. What eukaryotes have, what mitochondria conferred, is four to five orders of magnitude more energy per gene. It's energy per gene. What, that, what, what happened was that eukaryotes do not use their cytoplasmic membrane for energy production. They use internalized membranes, and because they have each gene is governing that much more energy, it allowed them to be freed from the constraints on genome size that prokaryotes are uh, restrained by, and this allowed the genomes to expand and gene expression to take place for all those new genes that they were discovering. It allowed eukaryotes to explore sequence space and genome space in a manner that was not penalized by bioenergetics. Let's recall that about 70 to 80 percent of the energy budget of a cell goes to protein synthesis. It's all about protein synthesis. That's because about 60% of the cell by weight is protein. So what mitochondria did was allowed those few nuclear genes that are left to expand, to generate uh, more protein, different kinds of protein, explore that space, and that was what allowed eukaryotes to make the jump to complexity. Once they did that, then multicellular, multicellularity was not such a difficult problem because we know among the algae, among the protists, the brown, brown algae and the, the, the animals, multicellular, multicellularity arose many times. So that's it. Mitochondria are key to complexity because they freed eukaryotes from the bioenergetic constraints imposed by generating chemiosmotic potential at the plasma membrane. They do this with internalized membranes, and this gave them more energy per gene, and that's what allowed them to make the jump from a simple symbiotic consortium to the um, uh, meiotic and um, complex cell that we call eukaryotes today. So that's it, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you very much. catching up so nicely. Uh, I got a little bit fast there in between, but I was running out of time. So we, yes, we can take questions for either of the speakers. Oh, yes. Wait, you need to hear. Take your microphone. Do you 
genome, well, uh, Bill has explained very, very well what was the function of mitochondria for the eukaryotes, and in particular, what they have done. The, just the uh, connection with the two talks are that I tried to, to demonstrate the way the mechanism, because it remains the coding of subunits which interact with nuclear coded subunits. So this is one aspect, interaction between subunits for OXFOS complexes. And the second point that I consider very important is the presence of a protein synthesizes machinery, but completely different from that present in the cytoplasm for the uh, nuclear-coded uh, protein, because probably for this property can, uh, can do many functions, such as that important in adaptation. Any questions? If there are no, yes. Uh, it's a, be a beautiful talk as usual. And I completely agree that uh, mitochondrial symbiosis should be the uh, first step for eukaryote. Mm. But still, I'm thinking that uh, we need some previous pivotal step for primordial eukaryotic prokaryote. Of, of course, we were initially prokaryote, then why particular lineage of prokaryote started to engulf uh, mitochondrial ancestor? Because without that pivotal step, mm -hmm. any prokaryote can do the same thing. Then we may have many multiple eukaryotic lineages, but we have only one. Why? Exactly. Okay, this is a very good point. The point is, um, can, can I get my slides back up? Slides? Hello? No? No? I can't? Okay, I can't. Um, the, the question is, uh, we only see one origin of eukaryotes. Um, uh, oh, great, I don't have it on there anyway. Okay. Do we have to have some preparatory step before um, the origin of mitochondria? Now, some people have said that phagocytosis is essential to establish the intracellular endosymbiosis. What I thought that I had on the rest, on the back of my slide, is a cover article by Carol Van Dolan of Nature in 2001, no, 2000, where she described a prokaryotic association where one prokaryote lives inside another. These are the mealybug and the symbionts. The genomes of these two are, have recently been sequenced. One is a beta proteobacterium living inside gamma proteobacteria. These are two prokaryotes that live one inside the other. It's an establishment of pro, a prokaryote and the symbiont inside a prokaryotic host. It does not require phagocytosis. So phagocytosis is not essential. Um, at the same time, uh, these cells are not evolving towards complexity because they are, it's an endosymbiont and not a mitochondrion. The key to the d difference between organelles in the sense of mitochondrion chloroplasts and simple endosymbionts is that the endosymbionts interact with their host via small molecular weight transporters, whereas mitochondria and chloroplasts have the protein import machinery, allowing them to restructure their genetic information, export genes to the nucleus, specialize to their um, functions, photosynthesis and, and ATP synthesis. So it, it's in, indeed, if you look around among the protists, now the, the unicellular eukaryotes, it's almost impossible to find one that grows without some sort of endosymbiont or ectosymbiont. And if you, if you probe the literature, you can literally find tens of thousands of examples where prokaryotes are associated with some sort of endosymbiont. And we have it in, in uh, infection biology all the time. But mitochondria only arose once in four billion years, at the same rate as the origin of the moon, the origin of the earth, and the origin of life. Once in four billion, it's excruciatingly rare. Whereas these endosymbionts, are, endosymbionts themselves are a dime a dozen. The moral of the story is that phagocytosis promotes the origin of endosymbionts, but it has no influence whatsoever on the origin of mitochondria. It's two different things, okay? So it's common belief that there was a preparatory step was needed, but I think that that's, uh, like Walter said, it's 
not only incorrect, it's completely wrong. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Walter. Uh, Walter. Now there's one prokaryote getting to the other <laughs> one without phagocytosis. This is not known. I, that's why I wish I had the picture up. Uh, I can show you the picture after my talk, or try to find it on. I'm not going to try to find it on my, my computer here in public. Uh, it, the observation is that one does live inside the other. There are actually two examples. Wujek also had an example of an symbiont inside a, a, a cyanobacterium in 1978. So there are two independent examples of prokaryotes living within other prokaryotes. The mechanism of entry is not known. Okay, we know yeah, we know the Belladibrio cases, but this is a bad how can bad you idea. Exclude phagocytosis because beta beta proteobacteria are proteobacteria; they don't have any phagocytotic capability. Phagocytosis means having a cytoskeleton and all the things that you need to engulf cells. It's a fully fledged machinery. Okay. They've got inside somehow. Yes. Okay, I, I actually have a question to uh, both of you. Oh, I'm sorry, was there, while, while, while you're going back to them, and that is this issue of you, you, you have so many mitochondria in a cell, they could accumulate mutations and accumulate mutations, and so you mm -hmm. talked about their coming down in number at the time of, now, so that sounds like an interesting novel mechanism that, uh, is anything known about what happens to mitochondria during, say, meiosis? Uh, do they, do they, are there special mechanisms? Are there special? How, how do you pick the right mitochondrial genome? Yeah. Well, the, are you referring mm -hmm. to the um, what I call quality control of the mitochondria? Yes. Well, unfortunately, you know, I think that is not very well known. But what is uh, absolutely uh, clear that uh, there is a bottleneck. So there is a selection of the number of the molecule of mitochondria, and then this selection can be before and after the birth, etc. And is a kind of quality control in order to give to the progeny the best molecule to survive. And the, in fact, the mutation, some, you know, uh, feature caused by the mutation, they disappear, they, they are, uh, you know, um, uh, in a few generations. So that's obviously because there is this quality control. So that's uh, uh, the, the point. The, the details, uh, you know, are very different for organi by organism and organism. But uh, in, uh, well, in the search in uh, the eggs, uh, as contain, uh, the mature oocyte contain more mitochondrial DNA than nuclear DNA. And of course, in, uh, in um, mammals, in higher animals, the, uh, there's the germline set aside very early. And so the mitochondria in the oocytes are actually never used. So they're, they're kept in a pristine condition. Uh, they're never, the, the egg cells are fed by the mother, so the, those mitochondria are actually never used so that they're not subjected to uh, reactive oxygen species, and those are the ones that are inherited while the male mitochondria are used very strongly, but they are not, they never contribute to, um, to, the, to, uh, uh, to progeny. So that's, that's part of the mitochondrial theory of aging, that the, these mitochondria are set aside specifically to protect us from further mitochondrial meltdown. Oh, thanks. There was, a there was a question, oh, okay. I have a question to Bill. Yeah. I suppose that uh, the prokaryote, uh, eukaryotic nuclear yeah. was already formed, emerged before symbiosis, right? Uh, so, so what I want good, to good, say is yeah. symbiosis is just addition to the uh, eukaryotic lineage. Um, okay, I disagree. This is, a, this is a standard theory, this is a standard thinking that the, the host that acquired the mit mitochondrion already had the nucleus. Now, one of the predictions, the, the main prediction of that theory is that the eukaryotes that we know that lack mitochondria should be primitively a mitochondria, and that turned out not to be true. It used to be that we thought that the cel cells like Giardia and Entamoeba that have a nucleus but lack mitochondria are the most ancient ones, the lineage of, that require, uh, acquired the host. And it turns out that these cells, all right, that, that have that have uh, that have a nucleus, they have mitosis, they have meiosis, they have the cytoskeleton, they have ER, they have all these eukaryotic traits. This required the evolution of 2,000 gene families, 
And this is what mitochondria allowed them to do. Okay, so the, 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 quest, the answer to the question of why do the cells that have all these complex traits also have mitochondria starts with the mitochondrial caus causality. It's based in bioenergetics. Yeah, but, but my point is that that's just an addition of advantages. The eukaryotic cell already emerged. Uh, um, <laughs> to quote Walter, that's completely wrong. <laughs> Okay, it's, com <laughs> this is, it's conventional wisdom. What you're saying is conventional wisdom. But what, what uh, and, and so we're, we're sort of, the last 10 years have been a revolution in microbiology. And I think Eugene would also, Eugene Coonan in the back would attest to that. This is what everybody thought 10 years ago. And it's turned out that all the, all the predictions that were generated by that, by that theory have turned out not to be true. And so that's why we've had to rethink. And now all the theories uh, that also in the textbooks, they start with mitochondria and they leave the nature of the host less, uh, uh, more open than ever before. Now, the, the, the genome comparisons that we did trace the host to the uriarchaeotes or the methanogens. There are other analyses that come to different conclusions, but all of the modern analyses are now tracing the host to within the archaeobacteria, not as a sister to the archaeobacteria. So now most microbiologists are tending towards the view that the host was simply an archaeobacterium and that this grade in complexity started with the symbiosis and was not preceded by some point mutation. Because if, if eukaryotes arose by some point mutation process, standard, standard evolutionary theory, then different prokaryotic lineages should have become eukaryotic for exactly the same reasons. But they didn't. It's one eukaryotic lineage in four billion years, and there were lots of opportunities. So that's why, that's why it's simpler now to actually associate these complexities with mitochondria. Walter wants to say something. I think Eugene wants to say something, too. But then you have to explain the origin of the nucleus. And the uh, nucleus... Hey, I've got 30 minutes, okay? I've got a good... I've got a full nature <laughs> paper on the origin of the nucleus. It's a great paper, okay? <laughs> but I've got 30 minutes, right? I yes, took it out. And, and the nucleus has a double membrane. Uh, no, so, the nucleus has a folded single... The nucleus is ER. The nucleus is ER. We're, we're clear on that. It's a folded, it's a folded single membrane, right? It's just like, it's the, the ER lumen. It's surrounded by ER and ER, it's contiguous with ER. And to make a long story short, uh, Eugene yeah. and I had a, a paper in Nature where we, we put spliceosomes, connect uh, the origin of spliceosomes to the origin of the nucleus. Basically, in this chimera, the uh, bacterium is donating genes to the chromosomes of the host. There are group two introns in there. Group two introns are generally recognized as the ancestors of spliceosomal introns and the spliceosomal RNAs. If these introns spread to many sites independently, then the cell cannot express genes when the group two introns undergo the transition to spliceosomes because splicing is slow. It takes about three minutes per mRNA, whereas translation is fast. And if you don't have a nucleus to separate splicing from translation, you have the standard prokaryotic um, co-transcriptional translation paradigm, then you're translating your introns and that won't work. So that cell that had the intron proliferation, and we know from Eugene's analyses that the eukaryotic common ancestor had about 20% of its introns in, in ancient positions, that in order to survive that, you had to um, in separate spatiotemporally splicing from translation, and that's what the nuclear membrane does, and that's why prokaryotes express their genes all the time, and eukary all the time eukaryotes only express their genes when they have a nucleus, and that's the cell cycle. Okay? It's not as stupid as it looks. That's what my former boss used to say to me. He says, you're not as stupid as you look, and it took me a long time <laughs> to figure out that it was not a compliment. Okay. <laughs> you, you know, okay, we can talk about this later. Okay. Uh, let me first make a couple of very quick comments to sort of support what uh, Bill was saying. And then Thank there you. are other things that keep saying. Um, uh, so coming back to the mechanism of the engulfment of that um, uh, pro-mitochondrial and the symbiont, as Bill pointed out, we don't know. But I think comparative genomics of the archaeobacteria, that's to you, Bill, the terminology, uh, comparative genomics of the archaeobacteria gives us some clues. Uh, it turns out they actually, they do have diverse forms of cytoskeleton. In particular, True. some of them 
Um, you know, do have actin filaments, which was, you know, the actins were first identified by comparative genomic phylogenetic analysis, and mm -hmm. then, lo and behold, confirmed by cell biology. They really do have actin filaments. Now, I will stop short from claiming that they do have full fledged phagocytosis, but it's really within the realm of possible that such forms of cytoskeleton, and we keep discovering new ones, um, would help that engulfment considerably. It is not, may not be as difficult as it seems. Now, about introns. Actually, the latest analysis show more than what you say. Not 20%. What they show is, amazingly, that the last eukaryotic common ancestor had about the same kind of intron density as we have. About the as, same. As humans. As humans. Amazing. Not that high. Not, probably not the same amount of intronic DNA. Probably we, smaller introns, but the same them. Probably smaller introns, but about the same density. Believe it or not, that's very clear indication from our latest reconstruction. So this is all very compatible with what we are saying. But now, maybe, you clarify for me, um, for us, um, a few things in the Lane paper. Sorry? In, in the bioenergetic paper with Nick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, what, what, what confuses me there is that it seems to me that you are making all these calculations for the largest and indeed at the genomic level more, most complex eukaryotic genomes, like those of multicellular animals. Whereas we know full well uh, that may, a great number of protists have mm, very condensed genomes which are genetically really not more complex mm. than the more complex prokaryotes. Mm. So uh, just to frame this as a, well, there are two. The most basic question is why do you do it that way? And the, the second higher level question is what do you infer um, about the last eukaryotic common ancestor in terms of overall genomic complexity? Ah, okay. So, uh, can I have the slide back again, uh, uh, Mission Control? Can we have the slides back? Because Mission Control, yes, very good. And, 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 and. So, the answer to the question is, ha, we didn't do just the, the largest two carries. So, we looked in, in the, we looked at cell size, okay? So, here's the, sorry, here, excuse me. Uh, here we've got the prokaryotes on this side of the table and the eukaryotes on this side of the table. Now here we've got small, medium, large, and extra large cells. Okay, and this spans a range of genome sizes. So um, let's see, uh, haploid genome size for the prokaryotes, uh, 6 MB, 1.9, okay, 4, 9, 7.5, 3, uh, the, the, uh, 3,000 is the mean, 300, 3,000, 100, and um, oh boy, what's an example? Amoebas, amoeba proteus is our extremely large uh, eukaryote over here with 11,000 genes, a huge genome. And so we looked at a range of cell sizes and also genome sizes. And it turns out that um, the, the relationships uh, are, very, are very similar throughout, okay? So we're not focused just on the very large genomes or just on the very large cells. We realize that we've got uh, scale issues in all of this, and that's why we, we looked at uh, a, very, a very large spectrum, both for the prokaryotes, because there are some prokaryotes that are larger than the small eukaryotes. And to make a long story short, what, what happens is that in terms of uh, power per energy per gene, uh, prokaryotes become penalized yeah, for increased cell size, whereas eukaryotes do not. They just can continue to scale up. So. Uh, the answer to, to the first question is we didn't just focus on the large genome eukaryotes. We looked at a spectrum. And uh, the second question was what do we think the, uh, the genome of the last eukaryote common ancestor had? Well, it's a minimalist. It would be a minimalist estimate. And this would come from an, an analyses of the type of, was it Makarova at all from your lab? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, Inferring yeah. and just just inference. What is what was present? Now you have to do some calculations. Which gen, which lineages have lost and which lineages have expanded? But I think it's about 2,000 gene families that we have to account for in the eukaryote common ancestor: meiosis, mitosis, uh, endomembrane system, nucleus, the cell cycle. Okay. 
uh, membrane trafficking, that sort of stuff, flagella. We're talking about 2,000 gene families. So that's the minimalist estimate. Now, how big it really was, who knows? But that's maybe what was distilled from that. Two, uh, thank you. Just, just a additional quick, very quick question, if, you may, if I may. Please. Mm, why is it the case within this framework that, say, pico eukaryotes, the smallest one, yeah. don't thrive in mitochondria? Ah, they, um, they've, they, it's strange. They only have one mitochondrion, and they've evolved to compete just like prokaryotes have. They basically become prokaryotic, thrown out most of their introns, become very small in size, and they don't, uh, they don't survive by uh, cell complexity. They survive by becoming small and dividing fast. Okay. Yep. Well, there's some comment to this okay, we, we should uh, stop because, uh, because it's an hour discussion and it was fantastic, but the heavy night thing is uh, Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, just uh, a... I would like only to say that there are many ways to look at, to, uh, to treat molecular evolution in a different perspective. And my perspective was to uh, focus the attention on the energy. And if you look, oh, well, uh, but I recommend to read So, so now for something rather different, and I'm very grateful to Giorgio for allowing me to talk again, and uh, it's very self-indulgent on my part, and they've probably heard enough of me already, but I'm just going to talk about something rather different to what we've heard al uh, already, and this is a sort of sociological part uh, aspect to science, and this is thinking about how good are we at assessing the quality of science. So... On a regular basis, we encounter, you know, assessments of science. So whenever we uh, look at a journal, we assess the quality of the papers and whether we should read them. Of course, when we submit our manuscripts to journals, other people are assessing the quality of those, uh, those manuscripts and either accepting or rejecting them. And, of course, we submit papers to uh, promotion boards and so on and so forth. So on an individual basis, there's lots of assessment of the quality of science, the quality of the scientific publications that we're producing. But also at a sort of higher level, at a sort of governmental level, there's increasingly uh, assessment of the quality of science. And this is probably really epitomised by what's gone on in Britain, the research assessment exercise, which has just mutated into something called the Research Excellence Framework. So this is where the British government tries to assess the quality of science coming out of UK uh, university departments. And it's been going on since 1986. It's happened five times at about five yearly intervals. And central to this process is the submission from most scientists within a UK uh, university department, the submission of papers by them, which then get uh, subjectively assessed by a panel of experts. And then, depending on the score that a department gets, they get more or less money. So it's very, very important for uh, university departments to perform well in this process to generate uh, as much income from the government as possible. So we really might ask ourselves, you know, how good are scientists at assessing the quality of science? So uh, there's two ways in which we might approach this problem. The first is, is to have a sort of subjective review of uh, papers. So a panel of experts looks at those papers and assesses how good they are. Uh, the British government has uh, t uh, dabbled with this, the possibility of using bibliometrics instead, either rating a paper simply by the impact factor of the journal in which it appears, or maybe the number of citations that it's accumulated over some period of time. Okay, so the questions I really want to address here are how good are scientists at, at assessing quality, whatever we define as quality, how good are scientists at predicting the likely impact of a paper in the future, and in, in terms of impact I'm really just talking about citations, which is a rather limited uh, definition of impact, but we're thinking about how good a scientist is going to be at predicting how many citations a paper would uh, gain in the future. 
Uh, and also we might address a sort of related question. I'll come back to this one a little bit later. Is the number of citations affected by the journal in which a paper is published? So if we take two papers of equal quality and submit them to two different journals, would the one in Nature get more citations than the one in MBU, for example? So I'll come back to the significance of this question a little bit later. Let's think about these two questions first of all. So we've got a couple of data sets. I'm just going to talk about one of them. One of them is by far the larger. So this is faculty of 1,000 data. So most of you are probably familiar with faculty of 1,000. This is where a panel of experts chooses papers, which they then write a short report on, and they rate those papers on a scale of basically one to three. So they either rate them as recommended, must read, or exceptional. So I've taken the papers, or we've taken the papers, from one year. So these were all published in 2005. These are papers that are in the fields of biology and medicine. That's the only fields that Faculty of 1000 deals with. And we've got just under 6,000 papers. Now, importantly, these were all assessed within 12 months of publication. So the people assessing them do not have any real feeling for how many citations those papers will ultimately gain. That's kind of important. So we've collated uh, citations from Google Scholar. It's an absolute pain to get them out of the web of science. Well, it's basically impossible to automate. Um, and these were taken in November of 2011. So we've got about six years of citation information. We're taking impact factors uh, of the journals as of 2011. So those are actually the impact factors for 2010. Okay, so the first thing we might ask ourselves is really how good are a scientist at assessing the quality of a scientific publication? Now, if they're good at it, then two assessors should agree about the quality of that paper. So we can ask ourselves where, two, where a paper has been assessed by two assessors within 12 months, how closely do they agree? So we've got just under 1,300 papers which were assessed by more than one assessor, and I emphasize that both these assessments were done within 12 months. Uh, so, the correlation is about 2.24. So it's highly significant, but I don't think that's particularly impressive. Um, another way to look at it is actually the agreement between uh, assessors, and if we look at that, then the percentage of agreement is around 50%. But actually, just by chance alone, you would expect an agreement of 40%. So actually, assessors agree as to how many papers should be rated, recommended, uh, must read and exceptional, but they don't agree very closely on, how to, uh, on which ones should be must read uh, and which ones should be exceptional. So you know, you're only getting a 10% improvement in your score above uh, random expectations. Now, another thing we might think about is, OK, let's take this correlation in part, that might be driven by the fact that two assessors may have the same bias in, ten, in terms of the impact factor of the journal. So two, both, uh, I'll sort of let you in on a secret, which is not really a secret at all, we tend to uh, rate papers in high impact factor journals higher. And therefore, two uh, assessors may agree because they have that same bias. So you can look at that by basically doing partial correlations. So this is the partial correlation between these two assessor scores controlling for impact factor. And you can see that this correlation goes down from 0.24 to about 1.6. Uh, Still highly significant, but it's really getting pretty low, I would argue. You can actually do the opposite sort of partial correlation and look at uh, the score of the first assessor versus the impact factor controlling for the second assessor score. And basically, the correlation doesn't decrease at all. What this is really telling you here is that uh, these assessors are highly influenced by the impact factor of the journal and less by the actual intrinsic quality of the paper. Okay, so that's quality. So we might now go on to think about, ultimately, uh, think about impact. So as I say, I'm going to just define impact as the number of citations that a paper gains over this six-year period. And we're going to investigate the correlation between assessor score and the number of citations that a paper gains. So the correlation here again is very similar to the correlation between assessor scores. It's around 0.25. Again, if we take into account impact factors, so doing the partial correlation between assessor score and 
uh, assessor score and I've now lost my track. What am I doing? Assessor score versus what? Controlling for impact factor. Citations, sorry. Uh, assessor score and citations controlling for impact factor. So this is essentially saying, well, let's control impact factor and look at how strong the correlation is between uh, the assessor score and uh, the number of citations. And it basically drops to about 0.1. So this is telling you, without the information of what journal that uh, pa uh, paper is published in, you have very little power to tell the ultimate impact of that paper. I should emphasize, these people on Faculty 1000 are not stupid. You know, they are the experts in the field. So another way you can do this is basically a multiple regression and look at the relative influences of... So we're looking at an assessor score simultaneously against the number of citations and the impact factor of the journal, and the impact factor is two to three times more influential in determining that assessor's score. So this is really emphasizing this point again, that assessors are very influenced by the journal in which the paper is published, rather than any sort of measure of intrinsic quality. You may be wondering, well, of course, these papers come from a very, very broad range of fields, and different fields have different rates of citation. So it may be that some of the noise we're seeing is essentially differences between fields, but that's not the case. So if you control for assessor uh, to what's called a sort of analysis of covariance, so controlling for assessor is essentially controlling for fields simultaneously, then again, we still get this very strong pattern that the correlation of the assessor score is much stronger with the impact factor of the journal in which that paper is published rather than the number of citations the paper ultimately gains. So again, it's emphasizing that assessors are very influenced by the journal. Okay, so conclusion one is, I would say that it really is quite difficult to assess either the quality or impact of science. Now I would add one caveat here, and that is with the faculty of 1,000 data, the papers are, in a sense, pre-selected. So the individuals are trawling all the literature and they're only choosing to review those which they already consider to be quite important. But once they've made that judgment, their ability to, de de uh, to decide whether they are sort of quite important or very important seems to be really quite poor. Uh, and those assessments are very much dominated by this impact factor, not the future sort of impact of those uh, publications. Okay, so on to a slightly different part of this problem. So the other way in which we might assess uh, the quality and the impact of scientific publication is just to look at bibliometrics. So we might look at either the impact factor of the journal in which the paper is published or maybe the total number of citations that a paper has gained. Now, we want to assess both, uh, well, either impact or quality. So clearly... Uh, we can just use, say, the number of citations as a direct measure of impact. And that's, that's fair, although we might have to be aware that there are biases uh, creeping into our assessment. I'll come back to that. If we're measuring quality, then, of course, what we really want is that there, there, there to be a strong uh, correlation between the quality of a publication and, say, the number of citations. And is that the case? So the question we really kind of want to ask now is, what is the effect of a journal on the number of citations? So if we get two papers which are of identical quality and publish them in two different journals, then will the one in the high impact factor journal get more citations? And I'm pretty certain you're all saying, of course. Well, okay, I think this is the first time that anybody's tried to establish this and actually measure the magnitude of the effect. So really what we're going to do here is just measure the correlation between the number of citations a paper gains and the impact factor of the journal, controlling for quality by taking those subjective scores of quality. Now you may be a little bit worried because you're thinking, well, there's a little bit of circularity here because the number of citations is, of course, a component of the impact factor. But we can break the impact factor down into two components. The first is that it depends, of course, on the quality of the articles being published by the journal. But on top of that is this secondary effect, which I call the sort of reputation effect, which is the effect that the journal has on the number of citations a paper of a certain quality will gain. So again, we might have 
two different journals, we submit similar quality work to two different journals, it is possible that the one in the higher impact factor journal gets more citations just because it's there. Nothing to do with its quality. Okay, so is this the case? So this is looking at the correlation between uh, the number of citations and the impact factor for our three different sort of gr uh, grades of paper. So these are kind of the quality scores that the faculty of 1,000 faculty are giving us. You can see that all these correlations are positive and they're all very highly significant. So let's say, give a paper of a certain quality, indeed, if that pub paper is published in a high impact factor journal, it will gain more citations. So the next thing is to ask, well, how big is that effect? So you can use your linear regression model to actually predict, on average, how many citations will a paper of a certain quality get in, say, Nature, impact factor of around 30, it's a little bit higher than that, say, versus MBE, which has an impact factor of 5. So these are the ratios. So you're predicting for papers which are recommended that a paper published in Nature would gain about 3.3 times more citations than a paper published in MBE. Now you'll notice that the ratio of these impact factors is 6, and more than half of that impact factor is just to do with the reputation effect. So this is suggesting that Nature is not publishing papers which are six times better quality, they're only a little bit better quality, but they get a lot more citations because they're in nature. That's kind of all I'm saying in this, in this part. It's amazingly consistent, actually, across these different quality scores. So must read, this ratio is 3.4, and it, for the exceptional papers, it's 2.7. Now, there's one way in which we could be kind of fooled into believing that this relationship exists when it doesn't, and that's if uh, assessors tend to underestimate the quality of papers in high-impact journals. So it might be that you look at a paper in Nature and think, oh, it's failing Nature, I'm going to sort of, you know, not really believe it's as good as it is. And so if you underrate the quality of papers in something like Nature, then you'll tend to generate, artifactually generate a correlation between the number of citations and impact factor. But of course, I've already shown you that the opposite is true, that in fact you tend to overrate the quality of papers in Nature. So this is looking at... Uh, the score is positively correlated to impact factor controlling for the number of citations. So if you take the number of citations now as your measure of quality and then ask, is there a correlation between uh, assessor score and impact factor, then indeed there is a positive correlation. And in fact, again, that positive correlation is something that really dominates the system, that people tend to overrate the quality of science in high impact factor journals, and that is a very important influence. What that actually means is that these uh, coefficients are underestimated. So they're larger than this. So, you know, this is uh, really quite surprising that the difference between, you know, the really high impact journals and the sort of medium quality journals is nothing like as dramatic as we might think. And yet we place exceptional weight, you know, on those papers published in the high ranking journals. Right, so the number, my second sort of level of conclusions is the number of citations is strongly influenced by the journal in which it's published, and maybe more than 50% of the impact factor is just determined by this reputation effect, which has got nothing to do with the intrinsic quality of the papers being published in those journals. So some, just some general conclusions now. The first thing we really might ask ourselves is whether subjective assessment of scientific publications is a worthwhile exercise. So the British government use it, uh, expends a huge amount of money doing this. So the last research assessment exercise cost £20 million in direct cost. That was just the amount that they budgeted to do the thing. And that's just secretarial work and sending all the papers out to the assessors. I should say that I, I, I served on the research assessment exercise, so this is where my interest comes in. But the indirect costs are massive. So the amount of faculty time that is expended judging which papers to submit writing BS about the department, et cetera, et cetera. It's just huge. So I would think there's probably the, the real cost is at least twice what the sort of direct cost. So it's a hugely expensive exercise, and I would really argue that the subjective assessment of the quality of science is really adding very little value to the, the exercise. What about bibliometrics? 
Well, it's clear that bibliometrics in and of themselves are a poor measure of quality, but they are a reasonable measure of citation, uh, of, of impact in terms of the number of citations. Mm -hmm. But you must be aware that the number of citations a paper gains is very dependent upon what journal it was published in. And, of course, there are all these problems, and this is really why the British government uh, has, uh, has aband abandoned bibliometrics, is there's a lot of problems with adjusting the number of citations between different fields. And it turned into a bit of a nightmare, so they gave up on it. Okay, so I think I just have to thank Nina Stiletsky, who, with whom I've been doing, she was a former postdoc of mine, with whom I've been doing this analysis. Uh, and uh, if you want to ask me any questions, I'll be delighted to discuss this. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, uh, Eugene, yeah. So, um, so Adam, um, um, you only mentioned um, uh, three assessments here uh, from the Faculty of 1000. Uh, recommended, mastered, and exceptional. However, there is also the field controversial in, F, um, in uh, Faculty of 1000. Have you tried to look at the correlation between the occurrence of controversial and impact factor, for instance? Uh, no, no. So that would be interesting to look at, yeah. yeah. I have certain predictions. Right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the what, the uh, age or H? H? The age index. Um, very interesting <laughs> topic. Uh, it's kind of a subject of another talk. Uh, so, yeah. You know, there's a lot of uh, interest in trying to use H indices to, to assess uh, a scientist's ability. The trouble with that is I think it's too easy to manipulate. Uh, so I, I, certainly I've, I've heard in France where it became a, a part of the assessment exercise that in fact people just started to stick each other on their papers and people started to get these huge H indices uh, with really no effort. Um, the really interesting about the thing about the H index is that Hirsch, when he originally published it, predicted uh, that it would increase linearly with time. And it does. I was amazed by that. I, I, I thought about it. I didn't know. I hadn't read his paper for a while. And I, I thought about it. And I thought the H you know, will eventually asymptote because it gets harder and harder to get these high H indices. It doesn't. It goes up pretty much linearly for everyone. Um, yeah. So I was quite amazed by that. <laughs> yeah. When, John? I make some observation. One is that if you publish in open uh, essays, it increases citation. Yeah. Okay. And, so and I, one of the interesting things with that is whether that is a consequence of the fact that you are in a well-funded lab who can afford to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, <laughs> there are some confounding factors. But, yeah, I would love it to be the case that it really is true. And looking at my own publication, I look at the citations. In the short run, high impact journal may, be, may have an advantage. In the long run, it doesn't. Usually, right. if, if it's your specialty journal, if you publish in your specialty journal, you usually get better citation. And another reason is that you actually you provide more details. It, it doesn't have the page limit. Yeah. One thing I don't like the nature science paper is you know, it can, it can cook up a story mm. to, to public in science and nature. But you don't know the detail. Yeah. That's one thing I don't like. That. Sure. No, I would agree. But, you know, so one of the things we, you know, we were aware of that. So that's one of the reasons we took our citations over six years. Um, it would be quite interesting to redo the analysis on a shorter time frame, and we may, may do that. Getting the citations is a bit of a pain. But, um, yeah. Just a quick question. Yeah. Now, the viewers of the UK... Uh, you, you, uh, uh, is that a uh, foreign review or no. is that domestic? No, they're, they're, all, they're all UK academics. That's not good. Uh, it's not, but you try persuading someone from outside the country to do it. So just to give you an idea of what this exercise involves, so my panel had 18 people. Uh, every paper was assessed twice. I assessed, I had one of the highest workloads, but I assessed 1,300 papers. So, and, and, you know, the other, thing, the other thing is that in the Faculty of 1000, people are rating papers in their field. I was assessing because, you know, biology is vast. We've got 18 people to cover most of biological sciences. 
I was assessing papers from everything from molecular evolution, which I might know a little bit about, to animal behavior, ecology, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're all biological science papers, yeah. I've got no data on... Is available on the same talk in physical sciences? No, no. And the same talk in the same talk in the same Yeah. So there's, there's basically, yeah, so I've got data, access to, to three uh, data sets, all from biological sciences, which kind of say the same thing. But physical sciences... So one of the things that really struck me about this research assessment exercise when I served on it is actually... Nobody was get, uh, collating statistics like this, like correlation between assessor scores, uh, assessor bias. You know, nobody had really thought about the statistics of doing this. Uh, and there are th things that they should have been doing, in, in my opinion, and they, and they didn't. Nobody really thought about, about how to really do this properly and whether it's worth doing. You know, they've done it five times now. Nobody's asked a simple question as to whether you're actually getting value for money out of it. No, no, so this is, this is about to be, it's been a long time coming. So I collated the original data set, which was my scores in, uh, you know, the research assessment exercise at the end of 2008. So we've only four years later actually got around to really doing the analysis. So we're going to submit it hopefully in the next month or two. So we'll see. So how about... Uh, well, just, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Why would you say publish less? Don't appreciate that much the risk of publication. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the nice things about the research assessment exercise, in some ways, is that uh, scientists are only allowed to submit four papers. And that's over, um, you know, between five and eight year period, depending on when they choose to do it. So they, they, they do try and focus on quality rather than quantity. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I would almost argue that actually it's a pointless exercise. That in fact, the only reason for doing this is to, is to have a stick to beat universities with. So the other thing that became very apparent is when we got out at the end of the sub-panel 14 and we, and we certainly had the output scores, they varied very little between the UK university departments and the outliers were all obvious. We always knew who they were. So Institute of Cancer Research was way out the top and then everybody from Oxford and Cambridge down to Sussex was, had an average rating of, say, 2.7 to about 2.2. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so... I had, I had questions like five minutes ago, but I have two questions, actually. Right, okay. First of all, for young people like us who are just starting careers, uh, those statistics are essential, vital. I mean, basically what people look nowadays is that how good you are in, in, in publishing, including yeah. those, those so-called home runs. So is it possible to change this a little bit in the light of those statistics? Is it possible to change this a little bit to, to highlight the fact that... Well, High ultimately, in a are, sense, are over, over um, evaluated. And second of all, is it possible to do the experiment, which is taking one paper and submitting to two different journals? Well, the two and journals don't allow you to do that, but you could, you could potentially, yeah. Um, the, in answer to your first question, hopefully, an analysis of this type would just flag up the fact that actually the quality is not very well correlated to the impact factor of the journal. Uh, the only alternative I can see is that we level the playing field and get rid of journals completely and just publish everything on web servers and people read whatever they want. But that's never going to happen. Because I think PLOS has uh, some kind of ideas to, to generate new kind of metrics based on blog entries, Twitter, we publishing, yeah. but not everybody has a blog, not everybody's on Twitter, so it's... it's yeah. It's kind of 
They don't do it, and, and if they do it, they're probably not all that honest. They tend to be flattering rather than, yeah. So it's Andre at the back, I think. I, I was first. Oh, right, sorry. Sorry, Thomas. I, I would like to raise the issue, uh, an issue which, we, which has not been discussed yet. There are retractions occasionally. Mm. Yeah. So why not introducing um, bashing the impact factor when a paper is retracted? Because it's, it is uh, actually a, a question of quality of mm. the journal. Yeah, that uh, it's one issue. Yeah. It, there are others as well. But it, it one one question is ex the the review process and uh, the the quality or the criticism and critics uh, of the reviewers uh, whether the journal passes. Uh, sorry, the the paper passes into the journal. Mm. No, this is this is. At this moment, uh, I don't, don't know whether it's discussed in the community uh, uh, to to take this into consideration. Yeah. But I would think I, there, there should be a penalty. Yeah, I, possibly, but I, I think you'll find it would have a very small effect because I don't think there are that many retractions. Um, you know, I, I think some I saw some figures the other day. I may, maybe a thousand retract. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, I don't get the impression there are that many retractions. So. Um. No, thank you. Thank you for staying and listening.